You're listening to Agile Ideas, the podcast, hosted by Fatima Rabucci. For anyone listening out there not having a good day, please know there is help out there. For the day, or at least for the APAC region, today covering the concept of stakeholder success demystified with expert insights and practical approaches. I'm just going to do a quick introduction for our, our lovely panelists today. So um, we, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce everyone's surname, um, but let's start with Divya. So Divya is a highly accomplished leader in the telecommunications, project management, and not-for-profit industry, known for delivering complex business transformations, customer-centric strategies, and commercial results. She's a sought-after mentor and woman in STEM, international conference speaker, and a finalist for Gender Equity Award in Australia. Welcome, Divya. Thank you. Uh, we also have Lucy. Lucy is a governance and delivery specialist with expertise in organisational and cultural change. She invests heavily in team culture and loves to simplify chaos and complexity to help individuals optimise performance and feel connected as well. Thank you. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you. We, Thank you. we have Amanda, an experienced senior executive. Amanda brings over 20 years of professional experience in the public and private sector, where she has successfully delivered large technology transformation in a range of sectors. Amanda's notable experience provides the basis by which she drives efficiencies and increases productivity in businesses. Welcome, Amanda. And then last but definitely not least, Craig. Craig's an experienced program director with the ability to adapt to any industry through the application of strong discipline practices, leading teams across business, construction and technology. Craig is motivated by having the opportunity to keep things real and achieving sensible outcomes for businesses as well as being passionate about sustainability and diversity. Welcome, Craig. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're going to have a number of different um, questions to cover off today, some from our audience, some from me selfishly when I run these, I get to ask whatever I want for my own benefit, so I'll make sure I do that as well. But I just wanted to start off with very simply, I would love to hear from each of you what stakeholder success means. What does sex stakeholder success mean to you? So maybe I'll just start with um, with you, Craig. What does stakeholder success mean to you? Yeah, having a happy stakeholder. I think we were just laughing before around uh, you know, such a thing and uh, projects would be a lot easier without them. But uh, certainly for me, um, stakeholder success uh, certainly relates to you know, the overall outcomes for the project that uh, is, is trying to be achieved. You know, having a, a happy stakeholder along that journey uh, and an engaged stakeholder uh, is, is typically one that uh, uh, is, is happy for me as well because it's, it's a two-way street and having that open comms uh, is certainly very clear uh, for that overall success. Uh, stakeholders, as we all know, are all very wide and varied. It can be from the, uh, the, the sponsor of the work or uh, it could be the impacted parties or ultimate uh, customers uh, as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably get into the further into the conversation around, you know, the, the various ways of engaging, et cetera, as we go through the conversation. But, yeah, very much uh, you know, having that engaged stakeholder is, uh, is a successful stakeholder from my point of view. Thank you, Craig. Um, Divya, stakeholder success to you. Thanks, Fadima. Um, very similar to Craig, and I think Craig already touched on two of the three biggest things that I look for. Uh, having uh, the right uh, stakeholders at the right time is probably something I'll add to it. Not just in terms of you know identifying the right stakeholders for the entire project, but also right stakeholders for the right activities, which I feel is sometimes quite missed, and I can touch on it as we move forward. Uh, but yeah, that other than engaged stakeholders, very important all through the life cycle of the project. But also at the end, I think it's all about the outcome and the value generated for not only the project, but also the stakeholders. Well said. Thank you, Divya. Lucy? Yeah, I think um, for, for me, so success from um, a stakeholder perspective probably looks like their needs and expectations being met throughout the project and probably um, afterwards uh, as well. And all the usual stuff around everything being delivered, um, ideally on time, budget, etc. cetera. Um, but I think for me personally, um, stakeholder success feels like building that trust and that long-term support and those relationships um, so hopefully when you do things in the future, you're, um, you've got some credibility and you're supported. Thank you, Lucy. Amanda? Okay, so I'm going to be the controversial one. Um, <laughs> stakeholder success for me is not always doing what the stakeholder wants, nor 
what uh, I call <laughs> the polylop. It's uh, doing what they need to achieve the outcomes of ultimately the business. The stakeholder has a boss. Uh, the bo everyone's got a boss. Even the boss has a boss. And we are here to produce projects and programs that ultimately drive the success of the strategy for the business in the long term. The success of that stakeholder will be the success of that business. So sometimes that means we embrace hard conversations, but in my belief, it comes down to living your values, being honest and open and ensuring that you do what is right and in the, in the best interest of the stakeholder to achieve the business outcomes because ultimately they will be judged on their ability to achieve those outcomes as well. So I'm, I'm going to hit a little bit more of driving um, value and, and so far as living your values, uh, being honest, being open, being transparent, and that should give the best outcome for everybody. I think it's um, it's a really good call out. And the truth is we're not always going to appease our stakeholders as much as we want to, as much as we try. It's you're never going to get you know perfect run rate with your stakeholders. I'm sure you've all had maybe some experiences that are not so great with stakeholders that were very difficult. I am I'm keen to get into that shortly, but before we get into that, I want to go back to something Divya you talked about talked about the right stakeholders for the right activity. Now, knowing that we have stakeholders that vary greatly in terms of interest and um, their as uh, involvement in projects and things like that, can you give some examples of how you would tailor different stakeholder approaches to the different stakeholders? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback, so just ensuring that everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Already. Um, so what I mentioned earlier, Fatima, was something that I've observed uh, happen a lot uh, and quite recently as well, hence it's very fresh for me, um, is, you know, you do your usual stakeholder analysis you are, and you can use various tools for that based on, you know, influence, impact or, you know, what type of uh, engagement or a relationship they have with you and the project. Um, uh, but what I found that people kind of fail and in one of the projects we did fail was identifying the right stakeholders for the right activities. Uh, for example, I'll give uh, a recent example where we were doing a very detailed process design workshop as part of an overarching program of work. Um, and the stakeholders that were identified initially were your you know, heads of departments, for example, or leaders of that particular process. And when they were engaged in the process, uh, design, they were a little out of depth. Um, and what they believe as the requirements are quite high level, uh, still with the right interest uh, for the program, but uh, they did not produce the right outcomes for that particular activity. And one of the things that was identified is perhaps sessions like that are best suited if you get maybe subject matter experts or people who are closer to the process. Um, so that that just elaborating what I mentioned earlier around, you know, identify your right stakeholders not only for the whole project, but make sure even if they are not your stakeholder for the entire life cycle of the project, maybe they just start, at, they are engaged only for a specific activity. Great. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Amanda, knowing that you did share around not doing what they think they need, but what yep. they actually need? Yeah, there's also, yeah, there's either, it, it's sort of touching on governance as well uh, when we're talking about our, our, um, who we have in the room to make those decisions. And it's, you're, Divya, you're completely right. It's, you know, we're looking at levels. Um, we're considering where you are in a project, what level that project is, the detail requirement for the outcome. That matrix has, has to be solid to identify the people you need in the room. Too many. I mean, you, you never want me in a room. Um, I'm a distraction. I, <laughs> I'll sit there and drive everybody off off on some crazy tangent. If you want a detailed outcome, so really selecting who you need in that for the outcome you require is. is I couldn't triple thumb, thumbs up if I had an extra arm. Um, yeah, great call out. Fantastic call out. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Craig, I'm interested to get your thoughts on, you know, there's there was a, a funny meme going around the other day and it was, you know, about how everybody wants to be in the room. We've just come off some programs recently and every single person needs to know what's going on in the project and it's just not possible to get, you know, 50, 60, 70 people abreast of everything going on at all times, but they want to know. So how do you kind of help stakeholders understand when they do need to be involved versus you know, when they don't? Like, is there any strategies you can share in your experience in that space? 
Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, and uh, you know, everyone has an opinion on uh, on on all sorts of things. As you know, every stakeholder has. Uh, as their opinions and what's their opinions heard, I'm sure uh, that, that Amanda's probably sort of touched on some of that before. But the good thing is everyone's entitled to my opinion uh, as well. So that's a uh, that's a saying I live by, uh, also. But uh, you know, very much uh, it's and, and uh, both Divya and Amanda have touched on it around the right stakeholders, right time uh, in there, you know, and it all comes down to races as well. Understanding your whole stakeholder analysis, uh, you know, understanding which ones need to be informed, consulted. Everyone will want to have a say clearly uh, in there. But uh, you know, hopefully, if the uh, the various comms uh, plans and everything have been established uh, up front uh, with the various stakeholders. Not always the case, but uh, sometimes it's. Uh, you know, we have a lot of these nice to haves and we don't have the resources to have everything polished uh, neatly. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, you know, the, the number one for me around project management in general is always comes back to communication. If, if you can't communicate to your team or your stakeholders, you, you failed from the uh, from the very start. So you may not land the comms right. It's uh, you know, that should always have a bit of a feedback loop coming through there as to you know are the comms going through and landing uh, in there. You know, messaging is a two way uh, conversation uh, as well. But um, yeah, that's that's probably where I'd start. But uh, there's probably no one ultimate goal there's there's many different uh you know formats and tools and techniques for for various comms and newsletters and all sorts of things you can you can get out there but uh yeah that, that's probably where i'd start for team it thanks can, I, can we start this conversation thing happening i just i've got this idea craig you can we're going to chat offline because i don't i think you might like it where we should empower people to lean in we've got to empower our stakeholders mm. to actually lean into our program it's not all about project managers having to produce 500 reports to different cadences on different governance structures to so I'm I'm actually a little bit anti uh, uh, racy because usually you write the race and you stick it and you never get it out of the drawer again um, I do <laughs> like tools such as you know power bi that you can place over the top drill down effects and you can hand oh. these tools yeah uh -huh. you can hand them over to allow people to sit there and, and look about but lean in using something to allow our stakeholder to, to actually lean in and be proactive at being involved in the program and not so much yeah. back, probably I absolutely agree amanda on the, the lean in and that's that's critical for for any success but uh, i'm not so much a fan on all the, uh, the the tools they sometimes lead themselves into different interpretations uh in there but uh oh, yeah. tooling is great <laughs> yeah, agree with you, um, Speaking of tools, um, so I know Lucy and Elise and I have done some recent projects together and I think we spend a considerable amount of time on races. Um, and I think races, you know, are there to sometimes provide accountability but sometimes a bit of control. I'm keen to go back to, Lucy, something you mentioned around trust. So rather than trying to drive control, how do we facilitate or how does the PMO facilitate trust between stakeholders, you know, from the get-go? Yeah, I, I think um, kind of st there's some really good points there, and um, I do I do really support that assertion that um, I don't know we 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 take on this responsibility to um, to kind of spoon feed in in terms of communication, and um, it's very interesting because I've never I've never actually thought about that before. I think I probably sit in the camp where um, you know somebody isn't communicated to and then you know like a stakeholder kind of um comes out of the woodwork late on and you can kind of feel some responsibility for that it is a two-way um channel so i shall reflect on that that's really interesting um i think in terms of um kind of tools um i think that was a question for team up was it around the kind of well, basically the tools are a means to an end but building trust like how do we build trust? Oh, building trust that's it but building yeah. trust so I think that um, one way to build um, trust that I think really works is um, being proactive. So when kind of feedback comes in and questions and kind of concerns, um, really getting on top of that quickly and not letting things fester um, and kind of small issues becoming um, significant challenges. I also think that um, investing in your network, like particularly where... Um, you've got highly um, like influential stakeholders, it's kind of worth really involving them in the decision-making for the project because I think it can lead to, um, to better engagement. So if there's appropriate decision-making forums, 
um, for influential stakeholders to be brought into. I think that's a really good way of kind of, you know, not just, again, here's the comms, here's the update, like get involved in what we're doing in the direction of the project if you really um, invested in and um, invested in the outcomes. I think the other way to build trust is over um, like over time and with action. So making sure that there isn't too much kind of message management um, in the information that we send out. So there's real kind of, um, you know, transparency. So the same people are getting the same message. It doesn't get too um, politicised. Thanks, um, Lucy. Go ahead. Uh, yes, go, go, uh, go ahead, uh, Divya. I think you were going to mm -hmm. say something to add to that. Yes, uh, just a couple more points. Uh, I really like what you said. Uh, but a couple more things that I found in my experience that really work in building trust is uh, ensuring that there is time and space allocated for stakeholders to know each other, understand each other. I know when we are in a very time crunched uh, and most projects are really swamped for time. Uh, that's one of the things that we miss. You know, don't underestimate the social element to stakeholder management and uh, really getting to understand styles of working, personalities, um, and allowing space for that. The other one that I really find uh, that works well for me is um, delivering quick wins early uh, and delivering some value early to uh, stakeholders so that you can win their trust. And it can be something as small as taking their input and in implementing it or ensuring that they're heard. Uh, what this does is it builds a little bit of accountability and that there's follow through this commitment uh, and goes, goes a long way uh, in building trust. Thank you, Divya. Amanda? I'm going to say, I'm going to double down on what Divya said, but I'm going to say it a different way. It's culture, um, yes. which is, I think, a, a quick way of, of articulating it. Just I agree completely. Again, no blame culture because it opens up mm. uh, freedom of conversation and perspective. Um, the other mm. one is honesty. Deep, deep honesty. Just be raw. Um, if something's not right, otherwise everyone will get a, a watermelon project in a heartbeat. They'll, they'll cover up the red with a, a nice outward layer of green. Um, and that's just going to cause delay and friction. It's just going to go down a very sad path. Um, so I'd just add those two as well. And that, that brutal honesty in, in some cases um, and, and make sure your culture is correct. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Craig, did you want to add anything on the trust conversation? conversation? No, I could, uh, completely support that, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, the authenticity in there and building that trust and, you know, culture. We've probably all worked in organisations where, you know, the culture has been great and uh, you have that, uh, you know, sense of success, um, you know, and as, as Divya sort of touched on as well, build that uh, uh, engagement up front and, and, and earlier that goes a long way. Uh, and we've all probably all worked in organisations, I certainly have, where the culture just no good uh, whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, very, very much uh, you know, had difficulties and, uh, and stakeholders and combative stakeholders, just nobody aligning or agreeing uh, in there as well. Very difficult. What about the challenges? I mean, I'm, I open this to anyone on the floor. So one of the challenges early on, like, for example, when I was a junior and connected my career, the challenge that I had was being one of the junior people in the team. I wasn't really sure when it was the right time to speak up for, you know, fear that maybe my question was silly or I was going to look stupid in front of the sponsors um, or not really knowing. So the hierarchy sometimes maybe puts people off. So how do you know, like what, what advice could you give to those that are junior those emerging are leaders to help them to, to feel confident to speak up and to speak with stakeholders regardless of hierarchies in organisations? Does anyone want to take that one? I'll, I'll have a go to start with. I, I grew up with a very strong uh, culture and uh, uh, ethics from my parents of uh, you know, re respect your elders and uh, and uh, certainly but when I was first getting into projects it was I'd always just defer to you know the the older people uh, in the room uh, and you know, it was very much just sit there and wait for my turn and guess what my turn just never came around so mm -hmm. you know my, my encouragement uh, is that everybody has a as a voice uh, you know, in there and, and everyone needs to be heard uh, and everyone's different obviously in their uh, 
you know, with the, the introverts, extroverts, all those sorts of uh, uh, things as well. But uh, certainly encourage you to speak up, have your voice. Uh, and, you know, guess what? You may not, may not always be right, but uh, certainly having those differing opinions in the room and having the mix of people uh, is, is great uh, as well. So. Thanks, Craig. Um, Does anyone want to add anything to that? I, I was I think, just thinking um, as as leaders um, as well that we can support that to the best of our abilities. So, um, look, in, in my experience, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, it's often the people that are the quietest that have got the most value <laughs> <laughs> to kind of um, to offer. So I think that... Um, you know, as 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 leaders, we can um, certainly try and en encourage those um, those opportunities. Yeah, because it's it's often the quiet voices that have got the um, the most to offer. I think we've um, we've, we've been, oh, you go, Divya. No, no, you go first, Amanda. I was going <laughs> to say it's in the top left corner of your your screen, everyone. PMO in particular, um, project management as what I call its own industry, almost. Well, mm -hmm. it's it's leadership. It's at it, its heart. It's leadership. We put acronyms around it, but whether it's project management, program directorships, and in in essence, it's leadership. So it's it's being able to grow and get more mentoring on what works for that individual in how they lead, how they want to lead in the future. Um, mm -hmm. So every every facet of, I mean, the best management leadership books I've ever read is Dr. Zeus. Go and pull them apart because uh, you can find those leadership pearls in the most amazing places. Mm. Nice. Um, quick couple of tips from me, putting myself in the shoes of that junior uh, project team member, because we've all been there at some stage, um, is firstly, you have the advantage. You are junior, which is well acknowledged and everyone recognizes it. So use it to the, your advantage because you can ask those questions and uh, trust me, no one will judge you. And talking about seeing, you know, we speak, Amanda, Lucy, Craig, you all touched about leadership and leaders do recognize that and recognize someone who asks those questions. But at the same time, you know, maybe a quick tool that might be helpful is doing a quick assessment of whether that question is important for that conversation. Would it significantly impact the outcome of the conversation you're having? Could you perhaps do it in a different setting uh, or get that information elsewhere? If it's super critical to the conversation, go, go ask it, you know, don't uh, say Second guess yourself, like you said, Craig, it works, it may not work, but uh, it's worth asking. Hmm. I like that. That's um, a really good uh, example. Um, the right communication for the right time, as is the right communication for the right stakeholder. So I think that's a really good call out and probably some advice I could have used a few years ago. Um, so thank you. Um, I am curious, um, selfishly, I'm thinking about one of the challenges we often see in a lot of client organisations we work with where they think that change management um, or change managers are the ones responsible for stakeholder management. So the change managers, change managers, sorry, are the ones doing the stakeholder matrices. The change managers are doing this and are doing that. But really, stakeholder um, success and stakeholder management is is all of our jobs as PMO leaders, project professionals. So um, what what's your feedback on that? It's, it's it's not the change manager's job. It's up to us. So what would be the the sort of top three things that you would do? Um, in that capacity, knowing that, you know, we're not change managers, but we need to manage our stakeholders better. Hmm. I wouldn't change a thing I do because I don't actually think that way. So I can't answer the question. If anyone is thinking in that regard, um, they probably need to come along and join this panel panel discussion and have a little update. Um, that is so antiquated. I, I haven't got words. Uh, it, stakeholder engagement, uh, stakeholders internally, externally, um, even down to just within your own team. It, it purely is everybody's responsibility. And that's why I think I, I brought out earlier, including the stakeholders' responsibility. We all, I mean, are adults. We should take responsibility for, for a, the, the communal um, outcome, which is providing project management to have a successful program or project to deliver the outcomes to the business requires. Uh, so we're all of a vested interest and everybody should participate. So that's it's curious that someone would think that in my perspective. Yeah, that's uh, more common, I think, than I realise. I know we've had some 
um, experiences recently where it's sort of just disregarded for the most part and left it as it's the change manager's job, which is obviously not correct. So that's where I thought, oh, I wonder if that's, so maybe, maybe it's just, yeah, exactly. Maybe I'll put you in touch with them. So I'll let you chat with us. There's something that's got the right. <laughs> exactly. They call it a myth buster. There you go. For anyone online that thinks that stakeholder management is change manager's job, it's not. Obviously a big part of it, but yeah. In, look, if you have a change manager in your organisation, link up with them. They've probably done the work to assess the stakeholders, to put the matrices together. You could probably leverage that. But yeah, yeah. I agree with you. It's definitely not. Anyone want to add anything on that one before we move on? I, I was um, I was just thinking, I, I really like this energy around, you know, making the stakeholders actually come to the party. But I was thinking, um, again, as leaders, like one thing um, that we can do is I guess really um, kind of role model what a collaborative culture mm. looks like um, mm. and, and keep that really kind of front of mind to make sure that um, any cadences we're running or um, like the way that we communicate, that we're really kind of like expressing that, that, you know, this is not a playground, it's, um, it's an adult environment, hopefully, and let's all get involved. That's 100%, Lucy. It should start at the top. I know the last program we were on, it was a, you know very clear collaborative from the CEO down, and access uh, through him to the board. So that was that tone was set, and that's why I sort of call out culture. That tone has to be set. It, if if everyone yes, that, it 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 is yeah, amazing when it happens. Amazing. So, so then talking about culture. Um, there's obviously going to be situations that you've probably all experienced where the stakeholder assigned is maybe not suitable, not working out. And I'm um, so Mark has a question around how do you approach a situation where the stakeholder assigned is not working out or maybe difficult stakeholders in general? Are there any examples that you can share and how you tackled that? I've got a million. Yeah, I was going to say, it comes down sometimes it's just a personality clash and, and yeah. you actually lever it. You just call it. You say, look, for, for whatever reason it is, um, those two individuals just can't communicate on the same uh, channel. Like, it's a little off. And so you switch mm -hmm. people. I mean, projects aren't so tiny that you don't have backups. You just switch people around if, and make that, make that communication more comfortable. I literally say it's like dialing in on the same frequency of a radio. You just need to find that those people who can very clearly, concisely communicate. And if that if if there's a breakdown in one one avenue, you can you call it, switch it out. Mm. It'll make life a lot easier for everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I didn't do it. Digging uh, in the sorry, Craig. But uh, okay, yes. you go, Divya. Um, you know, I strongly believe, and I, I know it's probably well uh, known and recognized as well that that's why we call project management roles or uh, PMO roles as leadership roles because there's a fair bit of uh, leadership that needs to be exercised. There's a fair bit of relationship management and interpersonal skills that are required. You know, I don't think I've ever uh, executed a project where I had the liberty of changing stakeholders because you get to work with who you're given and the same stakeholder is a stakeholder. And I think that's where you put your interpersonal skills, your, your relationship skills to test. Um, you know, building relationship, understanding their personalities, whatever tools and mechanisms you use to do that uh, will go a long way because you, you, the more time you invest in understanding those stakeholders and see where they're coming from, uh, you know, that, that really helps. Yeah, that, that's where I was going to head as well. If you, understanding their needs uh, in there, and yeah, you know, often the same had stakeholders assigned with uh, with no opportunity to uh, uh, jettison them, as uh, would would have been nice. But uh, actually, uh, sitting down with them, understanding uh, what are their what are their measures of success look like, and, and have had uh, you know, uh, um, instances in the past where you know to stakeholders have had very differing uh, views uh, on, on where they need to get to. You know, one was going to save capital funding up front, whereas the uh, the other might uh, you know, save on OPEX uh, or, or it's going to cost them more uh, to operate mm -hmm. uh, in a certain way. So, um, and and using those skills, as, as you said, Divya, uh, to uh, sort of negotiate and, uh, you know, at, at, at times you, you may not have a happy stakeholder uh, on the back of it, but uh, they may concede. But being able to negotiate and actually work through and uh, for everybody to understand 
um, as well. But uh, yeah, sometimes it just comes down to negotiation um, and uh, using those interpersonal skills. Craig, you may find this, I find a little bit of disruption like that, where there is a difference of opinion actually grows a, a greater connectivity. Working, I mean, they, the best one of steals, yeah. forge and fire. You know, you, you have a bit of tension. You can, If you embrace the tension and you literally drive through that, you actually come out stronger. I, I, I agree, Amanda, and uh, I, I thrive on some of that, to be honest, mm -hmm. at, uh, at, at times as well. I, I love it when it comes together. Otherwise, it's a bit boring. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, uh, but, but, but certainly when, when that comes up and, uh, you know, but mm -hmm. being able to get them in a room on a call or, or the likes there and, and, and tease through that tension. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and often I've found out it can be pretty easily worked through. A lot of it's probably mm -hmm. deep-rooted history between two individuals potentially uh, as well. Uh, and just being inadvertently thrown in the middle of it, but uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's some of that tension uh, can be healthy uh, at times, which is great yeah. and brings them together. I find that's enjoyable. The one I find really is you've got to be a bit more um, subtle with probably use uh, some different techniques. Is when someone's probably put in a role above their yeah, it's a promotional role, and they're new, and they're a stakeholder, and they're or they're a client of some to some form. Um, sometimes they are driven out of fear and fear is not a nice place to come from when you're trying to, to run a program. So those, mm -hmm. those uh, you can, if you're faced with that, is quiet conversations and leaning in and providing them with alternative external or mentoring or uh, a shoulder to lean on that's outside of any formal um, sort of process is is the quieter way to get there. if anyone's fronted with that that would be a more subtle way but I think those are more difficult than it is the somewhat combative I said she's <laughs> I want um, that you can sometimes get when people are actually very empowered and very driven towards their KPIs so there's different 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 that you can face it, it touches on, Amanda, something Guy was, was saying in his um, in our previous presentation. He was talking about sponsors and, and success and spot, you having the right sponsors. And, and he talked about, like, a situation where he didn't actually realise that the sponsor wasn't aware of what was going on. And it was that took those conversations and that honesty to actually then drive the changes that were needed to be successful. So it's, it touches on that perfectly, um, for sure. Yeah. I, I think... I think the other thing as well, just to add to that, is um, I'm sure we've all been environment in environments where, um, you know, where there's like unresolved conflict oh, yeah. and it starts to become like pervasive and, you know, like it infects your environment. So I think the other thing that, um, that, that might be helpful for anyone listening in is that like a tough conversation doesn't have to be a bad conversation. Yeah. It can be tough. It can feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing worse than um, unaddressed conflicts. That I, I've, I've got to tell a story. There's nothing like a good old-fashioned story. So, <laughs> and a bit of gossip will always permeate your project team, a good bit of juicy oh. goss. So yeah. when we found out that two of our very senior uh, leaders in the organisation were having a, of an affair, it all it flew. <laughs> And I kid you not, flew through the, the place. And we were in <laughs> FIFO, so we were fly in, fly out. Everyone has nothing else to do but live with each other for months and months and months on end. So that if it in the in a hard conversation, here's me having to sit down and actually ask my you know two and three line up uh, who who have ultimate control of outside of the project your career that could they possibly be more discreet. Uh, and not turn up to the hotel that we were all staying in, uh, asking for rooms next to each other. Um, needless <laughs> to say, we did quieten down the gossip. We actually got into a really good routine, and it was something like um, I, this is how I can speak about it because this bit will give it away. It's about about seven years ago, um, and all of a sudden the the affair actually hit, hit the newspapers a couple of years back. So I felt a little bit like. I did the right thing. We got through the project. It was really well, um, you know, received and we tamed everyone down and we got through. But it's curious, those hard conversations, if we hadn't had mm. them, sorted it out. But that's a very, that's a jovial, funny way to explain that very personal um, and difficult conversations 
uh, come to really good outcomes. Agreed. I love a good story. Thanks for sharing, Amanda. <laughs> I won't get a juicy one. one. <laughs> I'm sure you've got plenty. I've met you, and you're um, you've always got something interesting to share. So thank you. I am. I am. I just want to come back to um, just you know. Obviously, we're talking about PMO and the leadership. A lot of people on the on the um, on the conference today are in the PMO, but we know that people um, in the PMO often get to hear lots of juicy gossip and also are impacted by, um, I guess, stakeholder situations that may not be directly related to the PMO, but are outside. And we know PMO plays like that conduit role to really help resolve some of these. So. Question that's come through from Alan is like, how do people or PMO leaders in in help make these issues visible and, and help to address them? Like, what suggestions would you have if they were not directly related to that? What what ideas or suggestions have you got from a PMO perspective that we could do? Any suggestions? Maybe we'll start with you, Lucy, on that one. Or are you like me, Lucy, and trying to work out what's outside the area of responsibility of the PMO? Yeah. Yeah. So often from the really, uh, maybe if I, I can right. um, add an example. So, yeah. um, for example, let's say there's challenges in a BA practice or a project management practice. The PMO is not directly responsible for managing those resources, those teams. They hear some noise. They know there's challenges in that practice or that area. And the PMO obviously wants a program or the project to be successful. So is there any suggestions of how the PMO can make the issue visible and, and address it or what do you recommend? I'll talk to the practice reader. Okay, that's a good start. Sounds simple, but some people yeah. might not notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we're leaning on, on management there. Lucy, go. Yeah, I, I was just I was just thinking that um, I think for me it feels like um, similar to um i was trying to think of something different but this this feels like really cultural, cultural to mm -hmm. me again because it feels quite um something's come up that you think um is an issue but it's not directly in your um area of responsibility i think that you know in the in the right culture anything that's an issue is within your area of responsibility and so yeah um you know you you would lean into the channels that you've got um available to you to ensure um, that any escalation that's required is um, is done, whether that and you know often that might be like through through the um, kind of traditional chain of command. You might need to get a couple of people together. But I guess um, the most important thing to me there is if you see a problem um, and it's negatively impacting the organisation or people that you work with, then um, it's important to take a personal responsibility for doing something about that and not being um, passive. Luke, can I just double down, Lucy? You said something awesome there. I or, and usually say, we're project people are, are fixers. We fix problems. We want them raised. And by nature, that's why I always said, I embrace red. I've got a red car, a red heel red glasses and a bug with my phone <laughs> like I, I try to live <laughs> really, yep yeah see project people we love red put it out there and we will fix it so if there is a problem you know lean, like I use that lean in um I'm an advocate for um escalation it only if required on a lot of things that you can actually just go and have conversation with the person um just a quiet coffee uh, wine where required will fix most things. <laughs> yeah. Red, red, red wine, of course, Amanda. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, getting to it. people are people. We make things a lot more complicated than they are. Uh, I yeah, I really agree with that. At the heart of it, you know, problems are generally quite simplistic. They're, they're born out of worry or trouble or fear or a little bit of anxiety that can dissipate in next to no time. Just don't let them boil away, get bigger. Correct. Um, go and if I may yeah. yeah. quickly add, uh, I like what you touched on. Um, this is more common than you would expect. Project managers, uh, practice leads are often firefighting in the thick of things. And, yeah. uh, you know, things may be missed. They probably are not identifying risks and issues in a timely manner, which shouldn't be the case, but it happens. 
Um, I, I would look at it in two ways, right? There's a proactive problem, and I like what you mentioned, Lucy, around culture. Uh, why wasn't it identified in the first place? Because you mentioned from the example you gave, Fatima, is the PMO recognizes that there's a problem, but the practice leader project manager hasn't. So there's a dis severe disconnect in either identification of what issue or challenges are, and also in the communication um, methods, I guess, or, or, or the means of communication. So that's the first thing. Um, and really going back into your practices, your processes, your uh, plans of approach would really help. But proactively, I like what Amanda, you mentioned, the two of this, two of this two, something you can empower themselves. So you're giving them, you know, not only doing the fishing for them, but giving the fishing rod. So next time something happens like this, they are well empowered to tackle it. But then if, you know, it's critical, then, you know, the escalation channels, and there's so many other ways you can jump in and do the firefighting yourself. Thank you, Divya. That's a good call out. We are nearing the end of our session today, and I would like to leave um, on a positive note in terms of one um, top tip that you can recommend that you've used in your career any time that you think is probably the most awesome idea to manage your stakeholders as well. Um, could be something unique that you've created, something that you, you're using, anything at all that you could leave our audience with today. I um, might start with you, Craig. Yeah, the one that I always live by is uh, no surprises. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there's another sort of saying that I like that goes with that as well is issues don't get any better with age. Uh, and as Divya and Amanda were talking on that last sort of conversation point, it was absolutely get them out there, get them to, you know, get them on the table. There's a million ways to treat an issue, obviously. Uh, and that equally applies at work and, uh, you know, to my kids at home as well. Uh, don't just hide something because something's broken. Uh, you know, call it out and, uh, you know, collectively we can fix things. Anything's possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. Amanda? Okay, so anyone who's worked with RIM will know that it's work hard, play hard, to instill a culture of fun, uh, a bit more fun, because if you're not enjoying where you are and you're working 10 to 14 hours a day together, you're going to not live long. So, um, so I've, uh, so you wanted some unique, and I thought I'll go a bit quirky for the answer to this one. I've used games such as Ugly Mug. We literally had the ugliest mug we could find on the weekends and came for coffees on Monday morning, and Whoever got the ugliest mug got a free coffee. Um, and boy, there were some shockers out there. Go go to St Vinnie's um, and Rotary Clubs. You you provide some really awesome stuff. What else do we had? Oh, cripes. We've had our oh, Lolly Week. Um, oh, we even have Music Thursdays. Um, so look, create a culture that you're going to really thoroughly enjoy. These programs can go for two, two or more years. Um, you'll be working together, getting to know each other quite well. Um, ensure you can use some tips, you know, trip, tricks to to make that fun for everyone. We'll make I love that. Work. I wonder if the mug that you chose was red. No, <laughs> I found Bart, Bart Simpson's head was what I got. <laughs> I'm nice. I came in with a cat head. I was like, where the heck? He won, by the way. The cat head won. I'm going to try that with my team. Thanks, Amanda. Lucy? Yeah, I, th I think for me, um, it, it, it's probably like stay connected. Um, so I think when um, projects can get really um, stressful, there's quite a natural tendency, particularly with remote working, to kind of disassociate and become insular. So um, for me, my top tip would be to really um, be intentional about how you um, connect to people um, and your organisation. And and look out for each other and have fun for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Divya? Um, I'll probably make mine twofold because most of it has already been touched. Uh, firstly is stakeholders are people at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, the, the, we've already spoken about the social element and staying connected and investing time in relationships. I would strongly advise that. Spend as much time, whether it's a coffee with an ugly mug, whatever it might look like, uh, do spend time to... Uh, uh, know your stakeholders. And I think the second one is something I've already put in the chat. Um, as a early in early in my project career, you know, when you look at difficult stakeholders, really tough uh, uh, stakeholders, you tend to, the natural reaction is you tend to keep away. Uh, avoidance is probably a method that can be chosen. Uh, my tip is the noisiest, the scariest, the most difficult stakeholders, that's where you put your energy in because the quicker you have them on your side, the easier mentally and physically for your project it is to move forward. 
They're noisy because they care. True. <laughs> Very true. Thank you so much um, to all of you, to Divya, Craig, Amanda and Lucy. I'm sure that um, everybody found that as insightful and entertaining as I did. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, everyone. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Fatima. Thanks, all. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please share this with someone or rate it if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and to stay up to date with all things Agile Ideas, go to our website, www.agilemanagementoffice.com. I hope you've been able to learn, feel, or be inspired today. Until next time, what's your Agile Idea?